Welcome to R Montana. I'm Mike Penfold, your program host. I'm standing along the Yellowstone River right next to the Bozeman Trail, which came through this area. The Fort Phil Kearney Bozeman Trail Association and R Montana are working hard to preserve this history that's expressed along this Bozeman Trail. This summer I had a chance to video a Bob Wilson who worked at Fort Phil Kearney in Wyoming. Bob uh, is an expert on everything that had to do with Fort Phil Kearney, but also the Fetterman fight that happened in 1866. So meet Bob Wilson at Fort Phil Kearney and at the Fetterman battlefield. So anyway, this all happens, real wild guess, around 8 to 9 o'clock in the morning is when they head out. Now, the Indians got over to Fetterman Ridge at about uh, 5 in the morning in their camp, and they'd set up their ambush positions. And it, it was planned out way before the 21st. Uh, there was a battle on December 6th that probably led to the Fetterman fight. And in that fight, uh, Carrington uh, led 50 infantrymen and Fetterman led 50 cavalry. And they tried to do a pincer movement, which came together on the other side of the ridge. Uh, the biggest, one of the biggest problems at the fort was Carrington and his officers. His, Carrington was in charge of the 18th Infantry through the Civil War, but he never went to the field. He never fought, but he trained all the troops. <laughs> Coincidentally, Fetterman was in charge of them in the field. So Fetterman had a real low opinion of Carrington as a commander, especially a battlefield type commander, and didn't have anything real good to say about him. And neither did uh, Brown, who was another officer, or Grumman. Brown was a quartermaster. Grumman uh, was in the infantry at the time, but in the Civil War, he served in the cavalry. Um, and you might say Grumman was a, pretty much a Custer kind of figure. He, he was real aggressive. And, and all three of those guys had been colonels or lieutenant colonels in the Civil War, <clears throat> but they were brevet ranks. So when the war ended, they all got knocked back to their captain and lieutenant ranks. And uh, they wanted them back, and the quickest way to get them back was to have a glorious battle out here against the Indians. So that's, they, they, Carrington's orders out here were to protect the travelers on the Bozeman Trail, not to fight the Indians necessarily. Uh, when he came out here, he was under the understanding that they had peace treaties with all the Indians, everything was going to be hunky-dory, bring your wives and kids, you're going to be able to picnic out there on the beautiful creeks. He wasn't prepared for what he ran into, and he ran into it the very first day he got here. It, in one day, the Indians basically showed him that they were going to try to kill him, you know, and, and wipe out the fort. And Red Cloud had walked out of talks down in Laramie when Carrington arrived with the 18th Infantry. And Red Cloud says, you're here to ask us if you can travel through our country and build forts, and yet you already have the soldiers here to do it. So you already figure you're going to do it, and we're walking out. And they left the negotiations and said, if you try to build the forts for the trail, we'll stop you. And they did after two years. So you have the Cheyenne, Northern Cheyenne, Northern Arapaho, and two bands of the, of the Lakota, Minikonju and the Oglala, and a few of the other, uh, some of the other bands of the Lakota, not all of them. Okay, so you had 27 cavalry left the fort or 20, uh, excuse me, 49 infantry first left the fort under the command of Fetterman. Then you have 27 cavalry who joined him. Uh, then you have one officer disobeying orders who did every time there was a fight. That's Captain Brown. And to give you an idea of how far the horses were, he had to borrow Jimmy Carrington, Colonel Carrington's son's horse, which was probably a Shetland pony from what we can figure out, so that he could go along. And his excuse was it was one last chance to get Red Cloud's scalp. Uh, next day he was being transferred to Fort Laramie. He probably figured he was in a lot of trouble too. He was a horrible quartermaster. Very, very, very poor quartermaster. There were no records here at this fort from when he was here. He just didn't keep any. So he heads out on the Shetland Pony 
Then you had two civilian houses out in front of the fort over here. That one was a restaurant, one was a hotel. They were ran by Wheatley and Fisher, who were Civil War veterans, and they had gotten two Henry carbines or rifles uh, a few weeks prior to this. But anyway, they wanted to try their rifles out. That was their reason for going. So they asked, and they were allowed to join the command. And that's your 81 men. Not long after 11 o'clock in the morning did they cross the ridge. They planned all this out ahead of time, the natives did, after a fight on December 6. The cavalry are rearmed with the Spencer carbines. Carrington issues verbal orders at the fort. Nobody is to cross Lodge Trail Ridge under any circumstances. And at the same time, the Indians, the Minneconjo and the Ogallala figure out, hey, if we can get soldiers over here, we can probably do a lot of harm to them. So they start planning that. And that's when Red Cloud goes out to a lot of the tribes asking if they want to take part in it. Uh, I can give you a list of the decoys. Uh, but you have Big Nose and Wolf Left Hand is Arapaho. Or no, Cheyenne. Cheyenne or Big Nose and Wolf Left Hand. Uh, Arapahos are Black Coal and Eagle Head. Lakotas are He Dog, American Horse. Young man afraid of his horses, lone bear, young white swan, crazy horse. Uh, basically, they picked two warriors from each band of tribes that were here. And then they picked, a, that, that's about eight, but then you have two kind of uh, warriors that kind of represent the rest of the Lakota. Uh, crazy horse stopped at one time, because they do all kinds of things to keep the soldiers coming, to bait them, get them coming on. So a crazy horse had his horse act like he had got a stone in his foot or was going lame. So he's off there kind of picking his foot up, trying to clean his foot and stuff, trying to get the soldiers to keep on coming. And some of us think that probably happened right up here somewhere. Uh, but anyway, they agged them on. Now the soldiers and the decoys came over, right over on the uh, left-hand side of that high point. And the infantry, which were dismounted, they did not have ride that day, were basically uh, in a column formation, right about, you see that one post sticking up? And they, right about there, but they were in column formation, you know, four men wide marching. The cavalry were out in a skirmish line, basically from the bottom of that high point over to where it drops into the highway. You know, a guy about every 10 feet separated out. And then they all swept around and came right along the horizon. And they came over. If you look at these hills right here, there's three little hills, three little knobs going up to Lodge Shore Ridge right here in front of us. Can you see them? Well, they came over and they came down to that first knob and then they just kind of came right down, right in, right down onto here. And the Bozeman Trail came right through here. The, the best description of this battle in a way, and the most accurate one, is that the soldiers came over the ridge as a unit. They split up into two groups. They were attacked. They came back together, and then they split into three groups and were wiped out. And that's the Native American description, and that's it. There's, you know, not all the details everybody kind of craves, and they're, they're, but that's the only thing we know for sure. Now, the Indians on the 20 or on the 19th and the 20. First, uh, if you look kind of through this little valley over here, you see all those uh, kind of cliffs clear over there, kind of red and gray or red and brown tan right in there. That, that's roughly where the Indian encampment was. Uh, it's about five miles from here. It's a temporary encampment. On the 19th, the Indians came up and took their positions. Powell led the relief on the wood train that day, and then he pursued decoys just like on the 21st. But when he got to the crest of Lodge Trail Ridge, he, he turned back. And so the difference was that Fetterman and Grumman and Brown, who were notorious about going on the offense against the Indians, uh, didn't turn back. One of the three had made a statement that with 80 men, I could ride through the whole Sioux Nation. They got five miles into it, and that was about it. Uh, you know, they, they were real braggers about it, especially Grumman, apparently. The, the, on the 21st, he was told by his wife, by Lieutenant Wands, by Carrington, and several others not 
to go over Lodge Trail Ridge. They, they just knew he was going to if he got a command and was able to do it. Uh, so they tried to talk him out of it. They all gather up there and one of those four theories, they came over the hill and headed down here. By the time the battle starts, the cavalry are all the way down to Pino Creek, which is going kind of east-west down there by that big grove of trees. Only the part they crossed is on the part on the right side of the highway. Uh, and the infantry are still pretty much up on top of the hill. We th we're pretty certain that Fetterman is with the infantry. Drummond and Brown, the other two officers, were down with the cavalry along with the two civilians. The plan with the decoys was they were to cross the river down there and do a figure eight kind of a maneuver. And that was the signal to attack. There was one Indian up here, some believe it was dull knife, to signal that all the soldiers were in the trap. And now that morning when the Indians came in, you had roughly 800 men of Kanju in this draw over here, kind of right over these little hills right here. There's a draw that goes under the interstate or through over to the interstate. Anyway, they were in there. You have Arapaho down by the barn and on the lower part of this creek. Uh, and then you have Northern Cheyenne on the upper part of the creek. And then down at the bottom, you have the main body of Ogallala. And there's another group way on the other side of that hayfield, about a mile from the battle. Uh, there's a little ridge line over there and there are about 200 Ogallala on horseback behind that ridge line. And they came running over here. Um, there's approximately 1,500 to 1,800 Indians here. No more than 800 took part in the battle. Not all 15 or 1,800 took part in the battle. A lot of them just kind of watched it. They're just all tucked down in the trees. Now, part of the thing they thought was on December 19th, when Powell led them up here and turned back, the Indians thought that somebody had stuck their head up in the ambush and blew it. And that's why they turned around. So they went back to the intermediate camp and they asked for their tribal, whether tribal elders or shamans or whatever, to take a look into the future and see what happened. Well, he rides out on his horse and after a bit, kind of seeking a vision and comes back like he's carrying something in his hands on his horse, nothing major, and tell him, oh, I've got tin in my hands. And he says, well, geez, look at all the warriors here. Tin's not gonna cut it. So they sent him, kept sending him out back and forth, back and forth. Finally, he comes back and his horse is staggering from the weight on him. He's staggering all over the saddle and stuff, holding this huge weight in his hands. And he gets back to the, the leaders. He says, I have a hundred in my hand. And by that, he has a hundred or a hundred soldier souls, basically in his hands. And Carrington's first report was that he lost a hundred men, which I thought was kind of curious. But uh, anyway, they, that's the Indian name, or at least the Cheyenne name for the battle. So a hundred in the hand, okay. So anyway, your warriors came in. They're all in here way before, uh, well, before light anyhow. Uh, but then the soldiers come down here. The Bozeman Trail came right through where we're parked and right up this, right along this side of the hill. It's right here, it's right in front of us. It's a, see how it's kind of tore up right here? right in there that's the bozeman trail the soldiers come down here and they start getting split up by the time they're to that black flag down there they are split up and the cavalry is about a maybe a quarter to a half a mile ahead of the infantry they go down see the orange flag they head down that slope that way and they get to Pino creek and the battle starts and initially all these all the indians the ogallala come charging south the Arapaho and the Cheyenne charge up on this side of the slope. Wheatley and Fisher and about five of the NCOs, we guess, we don't absolutely sure, make a stand where that orange flag is at. And it's called the Wheatley Fisher Rocks. And there's a real good fighting position, right? The ridge is really narrow and a bunch of rocks to hide behind and stuff. They have the two Henry rifles and all of the cavalry that joined them all had the Spencer carvings that are repeaters. 
and if any of the infantry, well, none of the infantry really got down that far. So they make an initial stand and they blunt the initial charge of the Indians. That gives the rest of the cavalry time to come up into this flat where the low, we call it the lone tree position. The cavalry form a skirmish line and they're still mounted, but it curves around the head of that draw coming up uh, from the west. So see the black flag clear out there and then this black one here? They're strung out in a big kind of horseshoe from one flag to the other. Uh, then the infantry, they're a little bit beyond that furthest black flag to begin with because we're kind of starting down into the valley when the battle starts. And they, they shoot at some of the Indians coming up from the west, but then the Indians start coming up on the eastern side of that sliver down there. So they spin about face and shoot them. Then they form a battle line basically from the black flag to the light blue flag, the furthest two out there, and they're firing to the north. And then the Indians start coming clear around the hill and coming up through here, up to the flats there. And so the infantry swing around and they've got a battle line between the two light blue flags shooting to the east. And you have the cavalry on the west side shooting to the west. You have Wheatley and Fisher and some of the NCOs kind of holding the north end of the battle site. Now, what happens is uh, one of the decoys actually rode down there and he rode clear to Pinot Creek, did part of the figure eight. Then he turns around and starts coming up that draw. He, is, he gets hit. His name is Big Nose and he, he dies over in that draw, but he has his fellow warriors turn him so he can look uphill and breathe easier and watch the fight. That's kind of his last words is to point me so I can see the fight. One of the warriors, and this leads credence to the story about him splitting up the soldiers in the or the cavalry and the infantry, and the infantry coming down through here after the decoys is one decoy rode right through the infantry column, lengthwise from front to rear, turned around and rode right back through it again, and then kept on going. Uh, and then they withdrew to that position. So you had Indians coming this way, Indians this way, and Indians from the north. They're all focused on that. In the meantime, the men of Conju over here, and one account says 800, but there may have been 800 men of Conju here, but not all of them fighting. They came up out of that draw and came kind of up into here and jumped over this little divide right here, kind of where the cows are down there or whatever, and they go on up this valley right here, and they go right in below the monument. There's a big draw right up there. You see the tree sticking up? They go up in there and they dismount. And they come up on top south of the monument and hide in the snow and the grass and the brush. But the Indians hide there and they're gonna close the door. At some point down here, the cavalry and the infantry will, because probably this is the only place during the battle where uh, Fetterman, Brown, and Grumman are all together in the battle. And probably down there by the Lone Tree and you got cow or soldiers fighting all around them. They're seeing Indians coming up around this ridge here, right here in front of us, and coming around and coming up through that draw there. And they know if they don't get out of there, they're going to get encircled down there. So they make some kind of plan. The cavalry turn their horses loose. Up until this point, they kept their horses. And those horses running helter skelter, the, it stopped the Indian assault because all the Indians went after the horses. There's you know, no control of the Indian as a troop. So anyhow, they take off and kind of stop their attack and the infantry bail out of there and come up the trail, come retreating back through here, probably in their column formation, four guys in a rough step, moving as fast as they can. They come right down through here, front over the hill and right up the steep little hill to the monument. They pop up where the monument's at. Now at that time, of course, there wasn't a monument, but there were two huge rocks that were each about six feet by six feet by six feet. Someone describes them as it looks like a boulder dropped out of the sky and broke in half. And there were about 10 feet between those two rocks. But they spring out up over the top there and the however many Minikonji spring up right in their face, you know, 100 yards away maybe at the most. Back at the fort, they hear two volleys. And that would have been when they came up over the hill, there were four guy or four in a row, 
and they would have peeled and like, went like this. So you had two rows of, of guys, probably about 20 each, and they fire at the Indians. The front rank shoots and then the second rank shoots. And that's what they hear back at the fort. Up until then, they'd been hearing, you know, firing, quite a bit of firing, but it was all independent single shots, just a scattering of them. But here they had the two volleys, and then after that, it started getting quiet. Uh, there's still a little bit of shooting, but nothing like it was prior to those two volleys. They fired those two volleys, and the Indians ran right over top of them. Didn't probably take them about 10 seconds. The whole battle only lasts a half hour. It's really quick. So they run over to those guys and pretty much wipe them out. After the cavalry or the infantry had left down here, the cavalry probably fell back and formed some kind of circular formation there. We don't know if Wheatley and Fisher are still kicking or not, but they continue fighting down here for a while. Uh, but I think the last of the cavalry break out and try to get back to here. Grumman's killed right here, where this rock is. Uh, Grumman's still on horseback, because he's an officer. They stayed on horseback because they could see better. Okay. You have an infantryman, there's some rocks right over the side of the hill there. You had, or not an infantryman, you had a cavalryman down in there. We found his position. There's seven uh, Spencer shell casings around it and two arrowheads right in the center of it. There's three Spencer shell casings from the same gun going across here. So like a guy's running across, jack his rifle, shoot, run some more, jack around, shoot. Shot three times across there. Uh, a cavalry spur was found down over in there, and a few cavalry type artifacts were found down in the very bottom between here and the monument. I'm not, I like uh, a spur buckle or something. Uh, so that's the last of the cavalry in the further south they got back this way. The infantry are all wiped out within 40 feet of that monument. So you have 48, 49 guys killed. Most of them were stacked in that, between those two big rocks. Wheatley and Fisher, all, we don't know that there were seven men. We know Wheatley and Fisher were there, and we know that some cavalry were there. But the, they don't record how many or anything. They just say some NCOs. Uh, there's a story about Metzger, who was a bugler, who after uh, running out of ammunition was a Spencer used his bugle to fight on with, and the Indians recognized his bravery by not mutilating his body and covering it up with a buffalo hide. I think that is bunk. I don't think that's a true story, or real happen. Now, in the Indian oral history, they talk about three guys they find who are sitting down with their head between their knees crying. And they went up and pulled a buffalo bladder over their head and bashed their brains in. That probably true. <laughs> I, these guys had to be terrified, you know, just plumb terrified. Um, the Indians, as not only as part of their belief system, but as part of what happened at Sand Creek, really mutilated these guys. Uh, Brown may have shot himself. There's, he's got a wound on the side of his head, whether it's a pistol or the fu funny thing is he's right-handed, but the wound's on the left-hand side of his head. So there's some question about that. Uh, but all of them were pretty heavily mutilated. And the surgeon doesn't say anything about, like, Metzger not being touched. He said everybody was mutilated. Most of them were bludgeoned, were hit by a war club. If the, the arrows would wound you and some of them would kill you, but to make sure everybody's dead, they went along and smacked everybody on the head one final time, it appears. Uh, which is probably a good thing for most of these guys, because a lot of them were probably wounded hanging out. Uh, now there is a thought, you know, everyone, or it's assumed that American horse kills uh, Fetterman because he talks about bludgeoning a soldier leader on the head and then slitting his throat. But the Indians say no, that he actually killed Grumman. And they came riding from up there down through here, a group of warriors and Grumman was still fighting here, he very lethal on horseback with a sword. Apparently really bad news. And they kept trying to get to him, but they couldn't really get to him. And 
they think the American horse rode by and just smacked him on the head as he's going by with the war club. And he was he was aiming to get up here, but but that's their account. But they were in three groups. The bodies mostly there, there weren't a lot of bodies scattered between the groups. There were a few, but not many. And I think that goes by their you know their uh, unit that they belonged to. So the infantry all stuck together. And the cavalry stuck together. 20 some bodies are found down here. They don't give an exact number, just 20 some. There's some bodies found at the Wheatley Fisher Rocks, which is where the orange flag is. They don't tell you how many. And then 40 some are found down in the monument area. And that's it. I'm sure there was a couple here and there. The first day or the afternoon, evening of the fight, uh, they gathered 40 some bodies at the monument and took them back. And they left these. Next day, this I find pretty telling, uh, is that Carrington asked for volunteers to go out and get the rest of the bodies. And prior to that day, prior to the 21st, all these, a lot of these soldiers were all gung ho to come and get these Indians, you know. And all of them were really supporting Fetterman. He should be in charge of the fort or something. You know, he's, well, that next day when they asked for volunteers, there ain't anybody that wanted to go out and get, let the wolves have them, you know. Uh, nobody wanted to go out. And some of the men that were loyal to Carrington, actually, he got her up enough to come out and get the rest of the bodies. But when they heard all the shooting start, and I mean, it, you know, it went on for over a half hour, and it starts out ping, 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 then all of a sudden it's going, woo, 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 you know, and you can hear it plain as day at the fort. Well, the wood train had returned to the fort. They took those men along with some other roughly 80 men, they put them in wagons and they came over to that, that second hill over from the highway, to the left of the highway. They ended up on top of that hill with uh, Captain Ten Eyck, who was in charge. He sent a rider back to the fort saying, the valley is full of Indians, more Indians than I've ever seen. So up till then, they thought two or three hundred Indians was a lot of Indians. But I see nothing of Fetterman's command. I don't know where he is. And the Indians looked up there. This rider rides back to the fort, and oh, he also asked for the cannon, or a cannon. And Carrington sent him back saying, no, you've, you've got half of the men, and you've got all the ammunition so do with what you got you know and while that well that guy was riding back and forth the indians saw we at least this is what we think the indians saw the wagons and they were frightened of the artillery it had been used on them a lot they call it the gun that shoots twice because a mountain howitzer a howitzer in those days fired only rounds that exploded so and they experienced the exploding shells and exploding case rounds so we think they thought the wagons might have been a cannon or that there was a cannon up there. So they slowly start pulling out. And the reason they were hanging around was they were gathering all the clothing, all the leather, uh, whatever horses were left, uh, picking up all their arrows and whatever weapons they had. And they started pulling out of the valley, going north back to their main camp. As they pulled out, they could see a bunch of white objects up there by those rocks. But from that distance, they, uh, Ten Eyck initially thought they were cottonwood logs laying down there. But anyway, as the Indians pull out, he sends a couple of riders down to the rocks to see, you know, check it out. And they come back and tell him that's Fetterman's men. So there you have it, a story of a clash of cultures. Immigrants looking for gold and the Indian people whose homeland we were invading. It's a story about the young soldiers who came west, not knowing what they were getting into, looking for adventure, and finding themselves probably under incompetent leadership, and they paid with their lives. And you have to think about the Indians and those braves, those warriors, who gave their lives fighting for their homeland. This is the story that we have to tell here in Montana and Wyoming on the Bozeman Trail. Thanks for watching.